Okay, right. well, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, and I thought we could combine the roll call with the board member introductions, um, if that sounds okay to everybody. Um, I am Eve Lacey. I am the current board chair, and I have been a museum volunteer for some years, and I've been on this board for um, a number of years as well. So I welcome all the new members and everybody else. It's nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I'll just call out names if we could start that way. Uh, Kim, would you mind introducing yourself first, please? I'd be happy to. Thanks, Eve. Welcome, everybody. I am Kim Manage. I'm the director of the Longmont Museum. Um, and we haven't met in a long time, so it's so nice to see you all. Hi. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And since we're... Um, on the administrative people. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Mason. I'm the curator of history here at the museum. And so I usually present about the things that the museum is uh, proposing to bring into the collections. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, Joanne, do you want to go next, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Joanne McCoy. My title is executive assistant. And I am your secretary. Perfect. And then just to stay with the staff, um, Eileen, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Eileen Tijina. I'm the registrar at the museum. I am sitting in and will help Eric out. Cool. And then, um, I don't know, in no particular order, Dale, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'm Dale Bernard. I've been on the board for two, three years. I don't know, but I've been a volunteer at the museum for a long time and it's dear and near to my heart. So it's great to see you all after so long. Great, thank you, Dale. Bryden, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, um, my name is Bryden Cook. I've been on the board since, I believe, 2016. That's it? <laughs> it's been you. a long couple of years. <laughs> I know. All right. Um, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Looks like you're in a car. I am in a car. So this is Chris Bernard. Um, we're driving from Little Rock, Arkansas to Amarillo, Texas on our way home. Um, I've been on the board, I think, a little over a year. I can't remember. Time goes by. Um, prior to that, I was on the Art and Public Places Commission for about 10 years. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Rhea? Rhea, would you unmute yourself? Yeah, great. Thanks. Hi. Hi uh, Rhea Moriarty. Uh, I've been on the board for about a year. Great. Well, thank you. Thank and you. then we have two new members with us today. Um, Megan, would you like to start? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm Megan Arnold. Um, I'm new. As, as mentioned, I'm excited to be here and, and be part of the Museum Advisory Board. This is Mia. She's three weeks old. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so we're going to be feeding and diaper changing every so often. But it's great to meet you all. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And Thomas, last but not least. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, you're right. I did. There you go. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom Kurtz. I'm a new appointee to the board. I've been in Longmont for a little over four years. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And then I guess Susie uh, Hidalgo Faring, our um, city council liaison, she's either going to be late or not with us today. Is that true? That's what I heard earlier. That's correct. She had a conflict today. Okay. So she might, she might pop in at the end of our meeting. We don't know. Okay. Well, that's great. And thank you very much. And now I guess we'll get on with the start of everything. Everybody has a board packet, I'm assuming. Um, to look at and so the next thing I think on the list is um, for an election of officers and 
Um, I guess my question is, the nominations are, are now in order for the office of chairman. Um, do we have any nominations for chairman? I would like, Dale, I would like to nominate Eve Lacey as chair of the board. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Okay, um, Eve Lacey has been nominated. Um, so what we'll do now is vote. So all in favor of electing Eve Lacey as the chairman, please say aye and wave your hand. <laughs> Can we maybe get a second on that nomination first? I second. This is Chris, I second. Depending on which Robert's rules you read, you don't have to have a second. But we'll, we can um, <laughs> just- We'll be for, doubly set, right? Yes, <laughs> good to go. Like there's such a big competition for this particular position. <laughs> um, okay, um, all in favor of electing Eve Lacey as chairman, please say aye and wave your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, it appear, are there any opposed? Chris, you have to put your hand down unless you're opposed. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> I mean, if you're opposed, it's okay. <laughs> no, I was waiting for my name to be called. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, because it was unanimous, um, Eve Lacey is elected chairman. So now we would, I would like to take nominations for vice chairman. Do we have a nomination for vice chair? Dale. I would like to nominate Bryden Cook as vice chair. And I will second that. Are there any other nominations? Okay. Um, so we're going to vote. So all in favor of electing uh, Bryden Cook as the vice chair, please wave and say aye. 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 <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, opposed? Anyone opposed? Okay. So um, at this point, Bryden Cook has been elected as the vice chair, which is yay. So that's great. Thanks, Bryden. Thank you very much. Um, and then our secretary is Joanne, um, per our bylaws. Um, she is the staff member who's the secretary. So thank you very much, Joanne, for doing that. If she's ever gone, we have to find someone else to take the minutes. So got to be as nice as possible to Joanne. Okay. Um, do we have any public to be heard? Um, I'm not aware of that. Joanne, have you heard anything about any public? Uh, hang on, let me check my email quick like and just make sure that no one emailed in. Yeah, I see no one that wants in the meeting, so we have okay. no public invited. All righty. Um, so then we're going to move on um, to the approval of the minutes, which you should have all gotten, and it's very strange, but it's from February. <laughs> so um, I hope you had a chance to, to look at it. Does anybody have any um, remarks or did anyone notice any issues with the minutes? If so, we just raise your hand and you can talk. Okay, crickets. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Okay, um, Bryden, thank you very much. Um, do we have a second? This is Rhea, I second. Great, thank you very much. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes, please wave your hand and say aye, or just wave your hand. Aye. Aye. And anyone opposed? Okay, so the minutes from February um, 19th um, are approved unanimously. 
So this is going to be one of our shortest meetings on record, except for the preliminary stuff we had to do before the meeting started. Um, so Eric, would you mind walking us through the um, next sessions that you have for us? All right. Well, I have a PowerPoint, so we can all be looking at the same thing. So staff, if you could cue that up. We're getting it up, guys. All right. So we have uh, quite a number of accessions since we have not met since February. Um, this is the August 2020 proposed accessions to the museum collection. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So the first item on the list is um, Name plates from the old city council chambers. So I don't know if all the board is aware that uh, city council chambers underwent a major remodeling over the past few months. And um, uh, we wanted to preserve a little bit uh, from that. So uh, decided these were pretty easy to store and uh, kind of represented what a little bit about what the old city council minutes, city council chambers looked like. Um, any questions on this accession? Everybody else's titles on the top. Oh, yeah, that is good. Now we'll move to the next slide. Uh, so this is a basically a notebook uh, full of slides. Um, these were found after uh, Channel 8 moved out of the Carnegie Building. So we're guessing they probably were created by um, the Longmont Cable Trust in its early years. Uh, they're from the, about 1983. And what's nice about them is they do have um, a lot of different, like every church in town, all of the schools in town at that point in the 80s. So a uh, nice kind of snapshot of what, what Longmont looked like at that point. Any questions about this accession? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so this is annual report for the city of Longmont, 1966, uh, was produced by the city itself. They didn't do an annual report every year, um, but in the 60s they did this one. It kind of documents a point when Longmont was really beginning quite rapid growth. Um, and it has a number of photographs as well as descriptions of the services that the city provided at that time. Um, uh, any questions on this accession? Eric, I had one question. How long is this? I mean, how many pages or how long is the report? It is, I believe, um, it's a, you can see it's like an 11 by 17 report. So I think it's an eight page um, document. Okay, I just wondered if it, you know, how long it was, so. Yeah, Thank it's you. not super detailed, just kind of the highlights. Any other questions? Not, we have the next slide. Um, so these are photographs of a fire at the uh, Green and Turf Products plant, uh, 2389. Or Highway 66. Um, it was taken by the donor who uh, owned the farm right next to that turf products plant. Um, so one of the nice things about um, photographs that were taken by the donor is as part of the donation, then we would also acquire the copyright to the photographs. Um, so an added bonus to that. Um, and they show both the fire and then the aftermath, the, the destruction of the plant. Any questions on this succession? All right, we'll have the next slide then. Um, so these are some items that basically came from uh, Ann Matlack, who was a local historian uh, in Longmont. Uh, our father was a doctor. 
well-known local family. <clears throat> so one of them is a photograph of her. We didn't really have too many photographs of Anne, so I wanted to add that to the museum's collection. Um, another is an early edition of A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains by Isabella Bird. And the third is a small, uh, it's a little hard to tell in the photo, but it's, it's a thin hardback book called Hygiene Portrait of Small Town. It's got a lot of color photographs inside of it. And um, we have one copy that we've been using for reference, but um, for, for small run kind of rare local history books like this, I'm trying to now add a copy that goes into our collection just so that we have one copy that's really not being handled and damaged by the public. So um, that's, that's why those three things are, are in this uh, in this accession. <clears throat> Any questions on this accession? All right, we'll move to the next slide or that may be the last one. No, we've got one more. Um, so this is kind of an unusual one. Um, this is one that, that um, someone in another state found at a yard sale, kept for a long time, and we've actually been getting quite a lot of these, you know, quarantine cleaning inquiries. People are, are finding things and, and contacting us. Um, so this is a photograph, no information on the back. The only thing we have is the envelope that it was in which said it was from 815 Main Street, and it's postmarked uh, December 23, 1914. Um, so we don't know the work. who they are. What feature? Um, we um, do know that more than likely it came from Longmont, and this is a Longmont family. Interestingly enough, 815 Main Street doesn't actually appear in the 1916 city directory, which is the closest one that we have. So I uh, weren't able to really trace it down anymore from that. But uh, we haven't done a huge amount of research, thought we would you know, bring it to the board, see what your thoughts were on it, and um, if it's worth uh, bringing in and then, and then doing additional research, see if we can find out anything more about this. Well, those are the days when you just had the town and the state where you lived. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just sent it to uh, Mrs. F.B. Connor, Horse Creek, Wyoming, and it got there. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Any other questions on this, uh, this succession? All right, if not, I believe that's the last one. Um, we'll double check. Ah, I forget one. Oh, yes. There's one more. One more. All right. Sorry, I don't have the paper in front of me. Um, so the Bill and Lila Stewart family, if, if the board is not aware, uh, they are the family that funded the Stewart Auditorium in large part, as well as a donation, significant donation to the original construction <laughs> of the current museum. And um, uh, when uh, Lila Stewart passed away a few years ago, um, the contents of her house were basically available for family members to uh, take. And once the family had kind of gone through things, they said, well, these are things that we do not want. Um, and so they offered them to the museum. So we have um, basically Bill and Lila's, to be probably wedding photos. Um, we have a photograph of uh, Lila um, in kind of an old old time costume. Um, there are two others of them, one <coughs> at the Stanley Hotel and one uh, that was at a wedding anniversary. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to see. It's the one on the far right. It is um, signed by a lot of their friends on the map, um, and then one other of, of just Lila by herself, a color photo, and then one of their daughter, large color photograph of, of their daughter, um, who passed away some years before either Bill or Lila did. Um, so um, our, our plan with these is we would not leave them framed. 
we would take them out of the frames other than probably the one that has the map on it. We might leave that one framed, but all the rest we would take out so they're a little easier to store and store them in platforms. That is the thinking on that. Any questions on that one? Okay, well, if nobody has any questions for Eric, then um, I would love to have a motion to um, accept all of these accessions, if someone would like to make that. I move. Chris moves, do we have a second? This is Ria, I'll second. Thank you, Ria. Um, so um, let's vote. All in favor, please say aye and wave your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed, anyone opposed? Okay, so they're unanimous, unanimous approval of the accessions as presented. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I don't know what we should do next, except for listen to Kim tell us all of the things that have been happening since March. What is it? What do we decide? March 15th or 14th? Yeah, something, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it feels like a lifetime and yesterday, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so, you know, the thing that has happened, and we're all very grateful, is that the city has continued to pay staff um, through all of this. And so even, even our front desk staff, whose job is really dependent on having visitors in the building, um, we've been able to find other projects for them to work on. And so even though we, our doors were closed, we were all still very, very busy behind the scenes. And um, I tried to share a few director's reports with you all um, while we were closed and unable to meet. So certainly if you have questions about those other reports that I shared with you pr prior to this, um, let me know. We do, I think, have a few um, on this latest report that are kind of reiterations from previous reports. So I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. Um, I don't wanna read all of it to you. you you've got it in your packet. Um, but again, if you've got any questions, feel free to let me know and we can stop and discuss things in more detail. Um, I think one of the biggest ones that I want to reiterate for everyone is that we were able to achieve the SCFD tier two qualification. And I'm just gonna go into that a little bit, especially for our new board members. It might be worth um, explaining exactly what that is and what it means for us. The um, SCFD is the Scientific Cultural Facilities District, and it's basically a tax revenue source for us that is part of a seven county region around the Denver area. And it's a sales tax. And so basically we get a small portion of things that come in from um, people who are buying things. And we've, we've been kind of eyeballing this um, tier two qualification for several years now. Um, and the, the way that SCFD works is that it's broken up into tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one organizations are the big ones in Denver. And it's the art museum, it's the zoo, it's the botanic gardens, the um, Museum of Nature and Science, and the Performing Arts Center. Um, and they get the lion's share of the money. Tier two, which is now where we are, is kind of that middle section. Um, and there's the, the way to get into tier two is by your revenue. Um, uh, there's a revenue threshold that you have to meet in order to be able to achieve that status. And we were able to do that in our last fiscal year, so 2019. Um, and so prior to that, we were in tier three. And tier three, as a tier three organization, we were getting, you know, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. I think we got up to about thirty at some point. It fluctuated a lot, but it was never a huge amount of money. We were thankful for it, but it was never a huge amount of money. So this bump into tier two is going to take us from about twenty thousand dollars. We got twenty-three thousand dollars last year. Um, to $125,000. So a significant bump in revenue that we are gonna get as a result of, of achieving this tier two status. 
Um, that's a, that $125,000 is actually a, um, an estimate that is based on the projections. I actually think that it's, we're gonna see more than that. Um, what the board did is that they actually um, took their revenue projections and scaled them back 30%. And that's what we see with that $125,000. What they're actually seeing is more like 8% of a reduction um, as a result of the coronavirus. And so I think that in reality, we're gonna see even more than $125,000. And that's gonna start, we're gonna start seeing those distributions um, in September. So that's a really big deal. Um, the other thing that is happening um, with SCFD because all of these tier two organizations have been really hit hard by the coronavirus um, and they've been, you know, kind of appealing to the SCFD board to say, you know, how in the world are we going to meet this threshold again? Um, and the board has been trying to be very responsive to this because the reality is, is that if, if tier two organizations are not able to hit that threshold, then it means that they drop down back into the tier three organizations, which would really decimate tier three. So as a result of it, what they have ended up doing, and we are gonna, uh, the 27th of August, um, this will become official because the board will vote on it. Um, what they have proposed is that they will maintain tier, I mean, the, all of the financial information um, for the 2021 budget based on 2020. For us, that means that we will use the completed fiscal 2019 year. And so we'll basically resubmit exactly the way that we submitted this year. And the threshold will also be frozen to what it was this year. And so that means we're safe for next year. We've already done it. We've already met the threshold. And so we've automatically now met the threshold for next year. They're going to revisit this, and things may change further into the future. Um, but for this year and then for next year, we are safe, and we are in Tier 2. So that's really, really good news. Um, so I just want to if you guys have any questions about that, that's probably the, our really biggest thing that's been going on kind of behind the scenes. Um, so feel free to ask questions if you guys have any. Like I said, this is something that we've been really keeping our eyes on for years now, and we feel really quite excited that we were able to meet that threshold. And it's such a weird time for it to have happened because we're now in this strange coronavirus world. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say that that's great. That was my question, um, whether or not we were gonna qualify next year. Um, so it's great to know that they're going to go ahead and freeze that, that status. Yeah, it's not official. They will um, get it approved at their next board meeting, which is on the 27th of August. Um, but I can't foresee that there would be any reason it wouldn't happen. Um, they've, they have gone to lengths to basically vet this through all the legal channels that they need to make sure um, because the, the challenge with this is that they need to make sure that they're being equitable because there have been some organizations that have been able to stay open. There have been some organizations who've had some sense of normalcy. We, for instance, have been able to have all of our employees paid, and that's not true for a lot of people. And so they wanted to approach this in a way that would be the most equitable um, because there's a fear that people would sue as a result of it. And so I think that this really was the solution that ended up being the best for everybody. Um, and of course it's, you know, phew, for us, we feel like <laughs> we, 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 we really dodged a bullet there. Okay, yeah, Thank good. you. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, so other things I think that are on the list that I'll highlight um, is that uh, we officially reopened on July the 7th. I don't know if anybody has had a chance to be at the museum when it's reopened. We do have a lot of um, things in place to make sure that people are safe and um, for cleaning protocols and mask wearing and that sort of thing. We have tons of signs and we kind of hate it, but um, in order to be able to make sure that we're communicating well with folks, 
there's a lot of signage um, to um, draw people into the museum in the appropriate ways. We have limits on the number of people who can be in the museum. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys know we're not seeing tons of people come in at this point, um, but we're also not terribly upset by that. Um, the reality is that any money that we can make at this point is gravy for us because like I said, we're, we're already paying people um, and so we're not losing money by being open. And so we're, we're, we're feeling very glad that we're able to serve the people that we are being able to serve. We also had um, a great summer camp uh, program this year, which basically was all online. Um, and so we were able to bring in a little bit of revenue that way as well. Um, if you jump down, if you're following the report um, under education, um, we served 150 individual campers um, and some of those were enrolled in multiple camps. We also, through our Dodge Family Fund, were able to support scholarships um, for some of those campers. Um, well, let's see, what else do I wanna draw out here? Um, um, yeah. Just a quick question. How, sure, does, how, how does that 150 campers compare to previous seasons, do you know? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. I've asked um, Anne to put a report together um, so that I can look at those numbers better. Um, it, we saw a drastic decrease. I mean, there, there are a lot of kids um, and parents that, you know, by the time I, our summer camp started, there was a lot of online fatigue. You know, schools had already shut down. Um, they had already taken a lot of things online. Um, we, we definitely saw the effects of a lot of online um, learning fatigue. It did pick up a little bit as we got into the season. And so I think the first, the first camps were the ones that were impacted the most. And then of course, a lot of families were just not interested in doing online things. It was summer, they wanted their kids to get out of the house. They were, you know, so we, we did definitely see an impact, but I don't know those numbers specifically. I can certainly try to get them in a report for the next board meeting that we have. I was just curious that it doesn't matter that much. I just was curious how many, yeah. how big can, a from where there was. Yeah, we can look at that. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I think another thing, and, and we've talked about this various times, but Eric has uh, finished up his book. And so he's putting the finishing touches on the um, Longmont, the first 150 years. We should see, Eric, remind me, I think that the shipments are gonna be coming in in November, is that right? It's November, yeah. So we're super, super excited about that. Um, the Longmont 150 exhibit is gonna be launched next summer. And so um, this is gonna uh, be part of that kind of package of things that we're gonna be doing to celebrate Longmont 150th anniversary. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful book, and so we're very, very proud of it, and I think that it's going to be, um, you know, we we basically started the conversation two years now or something like that ago um, based on some feedback that we got from the local bookstore that basically nothing like this existed, and so we've been able to fill a gap and have an expert really pull all of this together, and um, we're very, very proud of of the book that Eric written, and we'll have it on our shelves soon. So thank you, Eric. That's very cool. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. We do have tons of fall programming that we're working on, and a lot of it is detailed there. Um, like I said, I'm not going to read all of this, but what I really want to say is that our staff has been remarkably creative and resourceful and talented and the programs that they've pulled together for the fall and for the summer, I think are, are something to be really proud of. Um, we are taking all of our fall, most of our fall program online. Um, we just don't feel comfortable with the way that things are looking in terms of the virus. And so we're with, with caution, um, we're bringing most of those programs online. Um, we do have um, some, some walking tours that we're doing that are very small. And so we're able to control numbers of people that way. Um, but I think this is the most creative lineup that we've done since I've been at the museum for three years. And so again, you know, silver linings that are happening as a result of, of being closed and, and being able to kind of focus on some things. Um, and so very, very cool programs that we're looking forward to in the fall. Um, so 
we've got our newsletter that's going to be coming out soon that'll you know beautifully illustrate all of this. Um, but the kind of list of things are there in your um, director's report. And then um, some other things to highlight is that we are going to be doing the Day of the Dead as an online virtual um, experience this year. But it's going to be really quite amazing. I mean, basically what we are creating is this resource for all things Day of the Dead. And so we're going to populate it um, slowly over time. Um, with workshops and and um, creative things and then also have these performances that will live stream um, and so I really feel strongly that despite the fact that we're not going to be able to meet in person this is still really going to be an amazing online festival um, and it's going to be a resource that people can use um, a cultural resource that people will be able to use um, and then the other piece of that is that in the galleries we're going to do um, the, what you're used to seeing, the altars um, are going to move from the um, atrium back into the gallery space. So we'll be able to feature the altars. And um, it, then we're going to have um, basically two halves of the gallery. And the other half of the gallery, we're going to feature um, an artist from Denver whose name is Tony Ortega. Um, and he's, his work is really founded in a, a background of Hispanic heritage. And so um, it's very relevant um, to, to the Day of the Dead celebration. And so to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Longmont Museum um, celebrating Day of the Dead, we're really trying to commemorate it in a way that's a little bit um, more than what we've done in the past. And so, again, this is another silver lining from Day of the Dead because there's we hadn't planned on doing it this way. And we needed to kind of shift our gears um, when all of this happened. And so we're very pleased to be able to host um, Tony in the space. And then we also were able to partner with the Art and Public Places program and they have commissioned Tony to do a kind of commemorative mural downtown. And so there'll be kind of an enduring um, reflection on this 20th anniversary time. So we're pleased that that was able to kind of come together too in this weirdo time that we're living in. So I think I'll, I'll, um, that's the last thing that I'll, I'll call out on the, um, maybe one other thing I'll call out on the um, director's report, which is that we're going to do, instead of the um, uh, holiday festival that we um, typically do in the Stewart Auditorium, we're going to do um, a webathon. So we're going to do this holiday fundraiser webathon. And so spread word about that. I think it's going to be a really very exciting thing that we pull off. It's going to um, hopefully bring in a little bit of money for us in this time that we've been closed and not being able to bring in some revenue. Um, and I trust Dustin to, to really do something very exciting. He's been able to pull off some pretty great programming um, while we've been closed and haven't had the ability to have folks in the auditorium. And I'm sure that he's going to do the same with this as well. So with that, if you guys have any questions about the director's report or things that are going on. All righty, Eve, back to you. All right, cool. Well, you know, if we don't have to buy our fancy holiday outfit for this year, we can spend it at the, at there, the you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, man. We have, I mean, it's, it, it might be worth noting, you know, with like stimulus that were happening, um, we saw a, a, some money coming in from people that just, that they, they were still doing okay financially and they wanted to support us. So that felt really good. Yeah, it's been interesting on the membership side too. We've had people who, you know, normally we send out renewals to people because people forget to, to renew and a lot of people have been sending them in anyway, so or and with a donation, so it's that's been really nice. Okay, so um, I don't think we have any old business unless I'm forgetting something, Joanne. Um, but we do need apparently we need to talk about or just um, clarify uh, when our future meetings are going to be uh, this year, and uh, when and where and then where the information about those meetings get posted. So part of um, what we have to do or what Joanne takes care of is that the um, notice that we're going to have these meetings gets posted at several places, I believe, in the city so that the public is aware of it if they want to um, attend. 
So Joanne, would you mind just reviewing what we're doing? And then I guess, I don't know if we need to vote on this or if we, we can just keep status quo here or uh, how we. Sure, well, if you'd like to keep your status quo, we've um, entertained the motion to continue to have meetings on the third Wednesday of each month at the museum at 4.30. Um, posting places are at the museum itself, at the Civic Center Mall on their posting board. And of course we post it online. So I think that's pretty much it. Time, place, and posting locations. Uh, Dale, I so move that we continue to have our meetings at 4.30 on whichever Wednesday you said, Joanne. This is Chris, I second. At the museum. I think you have to unmute. Sorry, remedial here. Um, all in a favor of keeping the meeting at the same time in the same place uh, and the same day of the month, um, please say aye and raise your wave your hand. Aye. Anybody aye. opposed? Okay. Um, so we um, will go ahead and continue the same time and then um, I don't know if we need a separate motion um, Joanne for the posting locations or do you want to just go ahead and include that in I, I can lump all that in with one motion okay. all right thank you um, so does anyone have comments of any type that they would like to make now that we're almost at the end of the meeting no comments well my only comments are that I hope that we'll get to the point where we'll be able to have these meetings in person, uh, even if we have to do it in one of the larger classrooms or something at the museum so we can have some social distancing. But it, it's been great to see everybody. And thank you so much for the two new members for joining us. We're really looking forward to having your input. Um, it's always good to get another point of view and then next time, I think Eileen should have her baby with her, too, so we can see the two babies. I know that's not very professional. Okay, if there aren't any comments, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> She's laughing. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, then I guess we will adjourn this meeting. By my clock, it's 514. So thank you all. Thanks, Eve. And have a nice uh, evening. You too. And thank you. Have a good Bye, trip, everybody. Thank, thank you, Steph. Thanks. Nicole. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Nicole. Good to see everybody. You too. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye. Bye. You guys are awesome. Thanks again. Oh, you're welcome, Joanne. I really appreciate your time and effort doing this, so. No worries, do you think, are you guys gonna meet next month? Will you just let me know so I can get it on the calendar? Yeah, I don't know, I, I anticipate we will. Okay, okay. okay. Thanks, Joanne. Right. Okay, thank you guys, thank you very much. You're welcome, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.